Meanwhile, let's find out what's happening with this virus, okay? I mean, people are getting it under control in their countries. In the United States, they have crossed 70%. I think they're now at 73%. In the UK, they're quite high. But the problem is that the um, Omicron virus is coming at you. It is present in the US. It is present in the UK. And it's just a matter of time before it spreads. In France, you have a serious uh, problem. I don't know if it's being caused by Omicron or if it is the Delta, but you have 50% of the IC be ICU beds have been filled up. So, I mean, it, it is becoming a problem in countries all over the world. In uh, South Africa, which has become a kind of um, experimental station and which has become a kind of country in which to observe the behavior of the Omicron, uh, what, we, what they are finding is that there is swift transmissibility of the Omicron but there is not a rush of severe cases in the hospital, so it seems to be milder. But the head of the WHO, uh, I saw him on television this morning talking to the world and saying that, look, don't make joke with this thing because it seems to be milder. Because if you get it, they are detecting uh, continuing and persistent after effects uh, which you know may have debilitating effects uh, on the individual so South Africa has become a kind of stage of assessment of the Omicron virus and we need to see what is happening there and to learn what is happening there meanwhile the issue of vaccines being mandatory or not mandatory uh, is becoming an issue. Austria has, has said 14 plus mandatory vaccines and we will see what will happen there. They have taken a very strong position. All right. And uh, in the United States, they are now given boosters. They have approved boosters for 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, the the um, 37% of the people uh, are saying that they will definitely take a booster, but 20% don't want a booster at all. And that is about the same number who are refusing to take a vaccine in the first place. So um, let us see what will happen. Um, let us see how this will emerge. And let us hear what Dr. Uh, Sean Mohan has to say about this. Is he on the line now? Yes, hello, good morning. Yeah, morning, Sean. I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Mohan, that we couldn't get you live uh, so that we can talk. This is the problem with the internet and the Wi-Fi. And, yes. And when it's weak on your side, we can't uh, connect. Um, and, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, okay, don't worry about it. Uh, let's get over the problem now and have a conversation. Uh, you left the UK a little while ago to come home to Trinidad and Tobago, which is your homeland, your home country. And the, the Omicron virus was not there yet in the UK at the time that you came to Trinidad, was it? So I actually am here in Trinidad on holiday. Yeah. I got in on Monday, so the Omicron was already there. In oh, the it UK. was already there, yeah. Yes. Okay. And, I mean, you are watching what's happening with Boris Johnson and the way they're dealing with, with it. He has a particular problem because he has a scandal on his hands of one year ago saying, telling the country one thing and having members of his office staff uh, do something else. So there's a little scandal about that. But against the background of that scandal, he's putting in measures that are pretty strong uh, to deal with the Omicron virus spread. For instance, he has 
basically made it impossible for people from, the, from Southern Africa to come to the UK uh, by banning travel from those countries to the UK. And secondly, uh, he is saying all indoor uh, activity, people must now wear masks. And um, they are basically trying to establish some protocols for dealing with this variant. You want to comment on that, first of all, before we get to Trinidad and Tobago? Certainly. Prime Minister Johnson actually has two problems. The first is the one you just mentioned, but the second problem is that he was criticized for being too slow the first time around. So he was told that he didn't act fast enough to institute face mask bans, bans on inter, uh, meetings. So he's acting very, very quickly this time around so that he avoids that criticism. And that is compounded by the problems that you've just outlined with his staff. In terms of Omicron, because it has so many different mutations on its spike protein, and they aren't entirely 100% sure how it will behave because it's still early days yet in the Omicron wave, they're taking every precaution just in case that it doesn't cause a lot more severe illness than they first anticipated. All of the information we have on Omicron thus far, even from South Africa, is coming from people who have been fully vaccinated. So the people who are fully vaccinated, Omicron has been showing to be a mild illness. It hasn't made its way into the townships in South Africa or in the, in the large unvaccinated pools of population. So we aren't entirely sure how we'll behave in these populations, which is why the extra precautions are being taken. Yeah, th th that is a, 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 a problematic uh, point, huh? which is that the, it has shown itself to be mild, among the vaccinated population, but we don't know what will happen if it attacks the unvaccinated unvac or when an unvaccinated people, person becomes ill. Why do you think it has so far attacked only vaccinated people and we have not had a response from an unvaccinated person yet to be able to, to tell what is happening? Well, I think we shouldn't say it's not attacked unvaccinated people. I think we should say that in the countries that have been able to sequence the g genome of the virus to look at the varying um, virus mutations in these countries, which are first world countries, they are largely vaccinated populations. So because the populations are largely vaccinated in these countries, all they have is the data from a vaccinated population. I mean, the UK, almost 88% of the population has been double jabbed. 35% have been triple jabbed. So the, the information that you have coming out is from a vaccinated population. It is when Omicron moves into unvaccinated uh, populations and the, the, where the vaccines have not been taken up for whatever reason, that's when we may see the full extent of it. Yeah. Um... So we still have something that is an unknown that we need to worry about uh, and are unable to anticipate because there's no precedent for it. And as exactly. You, you know, exactly. Uh, and certainly the, the longer people stay unvaccinated, the greater the probability of more variants emerging. So a largely unvaccinated population is a, 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 nursing, a nursery pool, if you will, for virus mutations, which is why we would encourage everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Now, this is a sore point I've raised on this um, program on many occasions in trying to persuade people to get vaccinated. I mean, li literally, the unvaccinated population becomes a breeding ground for possible mutations. And the, what that does is that it threatens the entire population, vaccinated and unvaccinated. Do you, I mean, I'm asking you a, a moral question here. I mean, is it right for people to take a decision to be unvaccinated, knowing that they are contributing to creating the breeding ground 
for mutations of the virus, which can turn out to be deadly to the rest of the population, including themselves. Is that right? From a societal perspective, no, it's not right. Morally, if we are thinking about each other as humanists, as, as our neighbors and our friends and families, our obligation is to protect each other, and we should get vaccinated. I mean, certainly vaccination is a personal choice, but in the context where all of us are in danger from this virus and its possible future mutations, we should all take up arms against it. And the best way of doing that is to socially distance, wear your face mask, and get vaccinated. These are the weapons we have, and we should be using all of them to make sure that we conquer and we beat this virus. Yeah, uh, the, the head of the WHO this morning was saying that one of the problems with the Omicron is that although it seems to be mild, one should have, take the precautions necessary to avoid getting it. That is to say, getting the booster um, and doing whatever is required, taking the necessary precautions to avoid getting it. Because uh, I imagine they are doing some research to see that once you get the COVID, mild or not mild, it can have lasting effects on the body and the human system. Uh, are you in a position to talk about that at all? Not only in terms of Omicron, but the COVID virus itself generally. So in terms of Omicron, the concern with Omicron is that it has so many different changes to the structure of the virus itself. Even though it's mild, if it mutates, the thing that comes from it may not be mild and may be very deadly. So if we can contain Omicron as best as we can, it will prevent um, it from hopefully changing to something that is much more harmful, more deadly, which is why as yeah. many precautions that can be taken should be taken. In terms of, sorry, what was the second part of your question? No, no this, the second part of my question is uh, that um, because there are lingering effects of COVID infection, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be very cautious about it and cannot take a a kind of cavalier approach to it because it might seem to be mild. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you aware of some of the effects of having had COVID and what can happen to you? Certainly. Long COVID is a recognized post-infection phenomena. Long COVID happens when even though the body has cleared the virus, the effects of the virus on the body has produced changes within the body that can cause fatigue, memory problems, concentration difficulties, chronic pain, and all of these can have a, a negative impact. From the neurology side, we've seen that COVID can actually cause changes within the brain. So when we scan people, so we have a pool of patients who have had scans before the infection for whatever reason, and their brain looks all right, we found that when some of these people come back in after the infection, you find a large number of white dots in their brain, and they complain of difficulty with their memory. They can't concentrate. Um, their energy levels go down. They can't work as hard as they would before because they get short of breath, and it can cause scarring of the lungs. It can cause all sorts of other problems in the human body, and all of these things can make a person's quality of life a lot lower. So COVID does have a strong, long-lasting effect on the body even after the virus has been cleared. So the, the argument that it's better not to take the vaccine and if you get COVID, that in itself will give you immunity is not a good argument, is it? It's not a good argument. Uh, we have been vaccinating children for, for, for decades because we recognize that giving them immunity beforehand keeps them healthy. The chance of a complication of, from one of these COVID vaccines is extraordinarily small. If you were to compare it to, to going out and being involved in a car crash, you are a thousand times more likely to be involved in a car crash than developing a serious complication from COVID. But 
no one no one would ever think twice about getting into a car and going from point A to point B. So the, the, the worry about the vaccine, the worry of the possible side effects of the vaccine, and we mean possible side effects, the vast majority of people who have the vaccine have no side effects, or if they have a mild side effect, which is a bit of pain in the arm or, 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 or fever, the chance of having a significant side effect is so small it should not stop a person from getting a vaccine. No, but from what you are saying, the worst side effects of the vaccine, and we have evidence on the basis of the numbers, and this is worldwide, that they are few and far between, uh, are less uh, problematic than the, the, the simple consequences of having um, contracted the virus because it can affect your breathing system, it can affect your lungs, <coughs> excuse me, and it can damage your brain. Um, this, is a, this is a problem, not so? It is. In Yorkshire, where I work, we oversee 2.5 million people. Of those people who've had the vaccines, who've had a serious complication, like a blood clot or, or, or a transverse myelitis or Guillain Barr, we've probably had five of them in 2.5 million people. For people who've had the COVID virus itself and who've had long COVID, where they have the long-term consequences that you just mentioned, the shortness of breath, the brain problems, the lack of energy, poor concentration, we probably have 50 to 60,000 of them. So it, the, the people keep banding about the, the harmful effects or possible harmful effects of a vaccine, but they don't look at the harmful effects of not being vaccinated. That's right. And we have to remember the number one concern of getting COVID is dying. And a substantial number of people die who are not vaccinated. So that's why vaccinations are important. I just want to establish this one basic fact, which is that not being vaccinated creates the conditions in which large numbers of unvaccinated can facilitate the mutation of the virus. And Absolutely it is, correct. And it is unpredictable how deadly one of those mutations might be. So Absolutely that, correct. So that, Absolutely correct unvaccinated pools of people endanger an entire population. So that's the, first, they do. that's the first thing. The second thing is that this notion that if you are not vaccinated and you get the virus and you are fairly healthy before you get the virus, you can overcome it and then have immunity afterwards is not an argument is not a good idea. The scientific facts do not bear it out because the consequences of having contracted the virus can in fact be severe and become what you are describing as long COVID. Is that true? It is absolutely true. That's quite correct. Okay. And the, and the third thing is that the fact that the virus might be mild is no reason to want to get it because you don't know what the consequences on your body and your brain might be. And thirdly, the Omicron virus has so much potential for mutation and is so unknown because it is an unprecedented virus that you really do not know what is going to be the dangerous effect of contracting the Omicron on your body over time. Is that correct? It is correct. And we can say Omicron has been mild in the vaccinated population. We don't know just yet what happens when it strikes the un large pools of unvaccinated people. It may very well be severe in the unvaccinated populations, which is why we want to take as many precautions now to prevent it from spreading. Yeah. I. Um you know, I mean, I, I, I find it on, I, I find it, I mean, problematic. I find it ironic. I find it difficult that, you know, everywhere, uh, the, those with scientific knowledge 
are encouraging the population to vaccinate, that those elements, some elements of the unvaccinated are resisting totally vaccination. And yet the whole world is trying to protect the unvaccinated because we do not know if the effect of Omicron will be severe on them and start a mass wiping out of an unvaccinated population that health systems, wherever they exist, will have to deal with. I mean, I, I, I find this very problematic and very ironic. It is, and unfortunately, we've all been the victim of mass misinformation. Um, we've been told about different medications, tablets that can be used, and unfortunately, none of the ones that have, that have been mentioned early in the pandemic has they've, they've been shown to, to fight this virus. I mean, we only have one that has recently emerged from Merck that has been shown to be of any benefit, but the others haven't. We've been sold a lot of bad information about the virus, about the vaccines themselves from people. And unfortunately, because of whatever reason, some people, they, they latch on to this misinformation and they, they hold on to it and, and they use that misinformation to not only not have the vaccine, but encourage others not to have vaccines. And Tragically, I've seen some of these people in, in the hospitals where I've worked, and you see them getting unwell day after day, and sometimes at the point of death, they are begging us to give them the vaccine to try and protect them, but at that point in time, it's too late. The time to get the vaccine is now when you are well. Yeah, I, I saw something from the IMF um, yesterday in which they say, scores of trillions of dollars are going to have to be poured into the global system, which the world cannot afford. It just, there's just not enough money in order to deal with the consequences of the Omicron, not to mention the losses that are going to happen economically on a global scale, on a national scale, on a regional scale, on a business scale, but also on the individual scale as people's jobs and incomes are affected by this. I mean, this is a crisis such as the world has never seen before. So I close on that and I give you the last word as we break for the news with Andrew Chan. I would just like to close by saying, please everyone, keep, keep your social distances, wear your mask and get vaccinated as soon as you can. This COVID virus can be beaten it will take effort, it will take a bit of time, but we will get there. All right, Dr. Sean Mohan, thank you very, very much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your experience with us. And we will talk to you on another occasion. This thank you is, very much for having me. Thank you. This is Brighter Morning with Bo. I am Bo Tiwari, and we break now for Andrew Chan and the 7 o'clock news. Mm -hmm.